Because we're human beings, when we're new at something, we tend to make mistakes. And when that new thing is an animal that relies on us for its health and well-being, sometimes those mistakes can be a big deal. Now, if your new thing is like collecting Pokemon cards and you make a mistake, Oh no, I forgot to put my Charmander in plastic and now I got my nerd fingerprints all over it. You know? I'm just kidding. If you're into collecting Pokemon cards, I don't really think you're... <laughs> Welcome to The Green Room, I'm Bob Bledsoe, and today I want to talk about six things that I think new snake keepers should stop doing, or at least avoid, because I don't think everyone does these things. Buying snakes. Number one thing, stop buying snakes. Just you. You should stop buying snakes. It's my entire list. My brother, everyone. Thanks for your input, Kent. You can certainly drop that in the employee suggestion box and it will be taken into consideration. I will put it in the suggestion box. Also, your Pokemon reference was offensive to people who collect Pokemon cards. Not me, I, I don't collect them because I'm an adult. But a lot of them are really valuable. I've heard from, from people I wouldn't know. It sounds like you have a lot to put in the suggestion box, Kent. Okay, let's get started. I tried to stay away from standard rules that you would easily find if you did a cursory Google search on snake care. And um, I, I used things that have come up recently, either questions that people have asked me or things that I've found on snake groups that I lurk on. Which brings me to number one. Avoid asking an entire Facebook group for advice on your snake. And I realize that that's what Facebook groups are there for. And I also realize that they can be very valuable. But there's a thing that uh, with these Facebook groups, first of all, many, many people that are active in these Facebook groups are also brand new. And there's a thing where people want to feel like others see them as someone who knows what they're talking about. That was a long sentence. What will happen is that somebody will ask a question and someone will immediately throw an answer in. Now that answer might be right, it might be wrong, it might be crazy, whatever. But those new people who don't really know the answer but they want to be thought of as someone who knows the answer will just repeat what that person said. Look on those groups. You're going to see a whole bunch of the same answer. And then somebody might jump in and go, wait a second, it's, it's this. You know, like for instance, if I posted, if I said, hey, I found a black dot on my banana ball python. What do you think that is? Somebody might jump in and go, oh, that's mites. Black dots mean, means mites. Take your snake to the vet. You got to do this thing. And then all of a sudden, mites, mites, mites. Everybody's giving me advice on mites. And then finally somebody jumps in and goes, hey, uh, that's a banana ball python. And they develop black spots as they get older. So that's a normal thing. I've got 20 other people telling me mites. So I'm going to probably treat it for mites when I don't need to. Incidentally, the inspector doesn't have many black dots. He has like three of them because he's also inchy and inchy takes away black dots in the bananas. That is not the topic of this video, but it's some information for you. Here's a good way to do that. You can still ask the group, but know who in that group really knows what they're talking about. It might be the person who started the group. It might be a moderator and it might not be. Uh, it could be just a couple of people that, that answer questions a lot and they seem to know what they're talking about. So ask your question and then post, I would specifically like to hear from this person, this person, this person and tag them. So that might be the way to do it. The one time that I think this is actually pretty valuable to ask the entire group is if your snake has some really weird physical thing going on. You can post a picture of it and go, hey, has anybody dealt with this? And if you ask the entire group, there's probably going to be somebody that has dealt with it. I mean, oftentimes it's just going to be, you know, it'll be a scale rot or a burn. These are really common things, mites, uh, mouth rot, something like, something like that that's more common. But for the stuff that's not as common, that is really helpful for us all to see that and to hear from somebody that's actually dealt with it. And by the way, the answer always ends with take them to a vet, which brings me to number two on my list. Number two is avoid not taking your snake to the vet. Yeah, we're doing double negatives in this video. Can we just do this? Can we just stay right there, Kata, like that, please? Okay, I know that a vet can be expensive and uh, it would be great to be able to just find a home remedy that costs you a couple of essential oils, but that's not gonna fix your snake's impaction. So it's important to have a vet and utilize them. Really, are you gonna squeeze like this? If you poop, Kata, you're so strong. Stop it. Thanks. Uh, where are we at on this? You're totally making me lose track. 
Now, I realize that some of you may not have an exotic vet right down the road and it might not be as convenient, but it is really important. Um, I'm lucky because I do have a couple of exotic vets in my area since I live in Los Angeles. It's a big city. I've got some vets. My favorite vet is just down the street from me, so I feel really fortunate about that. Dr. Seiko has really good training and she's owned snakes before, so she knows a lot about them, but I believe that I'm the only one that brings a snake into her office. Some of you might remember when Kata here was diagnosed with a case of lungworms. She had those when I first bought her and brought her in and we had to get those treated. Uh, I brought her back to Dr. Seiko for a wellness check and this is the front desk folks handling her because they were so excited they had never touched a snake before or at least one or two of them at, at the front desk there hadn't. Uh, so they were very excited to get to handle a snake. You would think that the front desk people at a exotic veterinary office would have had the opportunity to touch or handle a snake before, but uh, they haven't because nobody brings the reptiles into the veterinary office. It's a bummer. And please don't listen to the people that say that exotic vets don't know how to treat reptiles. That is so not true. They are absolutely trained to treat reptiles. What they're not trained in is the specific husbandry of every animal on the planet. Okay, but they are trained in dealing with disease and injuries in animals. And if you have a reptile that that vet hasn't necessarily treated before, they've got the information at their fingertips. For instance, I have a new black-headed python. My guess is that Dr. Seiko has probably never treated a black-headed python. She's probably never held a black-headed python. But I trust her to be able to treat Maya if anything happens because She's a trained veterinary doctor and she has, she can look up all kinds of information if she needs to. So trust your vets. Don't trust the people online that say that vets don't know how to treat reptiles. So you should just do your own home remedy. Don't do that. By the way, I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of veterinary information for reptiles. So when my animals have a problem, I take them to the vet. And I also watch Kevin McCurley's videos where he's performing surgery on his animals because he does have an encyclopedic knowledge. That doesn't make me want to perform the procedure that Kevin's doing. I watch it out of interest, but I'm not doing it because I plan to perform those procedures in the future on my snakes. Number three on the list is avoid soaking or swimming your ball pythons. This one is specific to ball pythons because there are some snakes that do great with the soak or swim. Uh, but I see on these forums that when somebody has a snake with a bad shed, the go-to answer is give them a soak. And there are so many better ways to get moisture onto your snake's body without stressing them out in a bathtub. I also see people concerned that their snake hasn't pooped in a while. And uh, a lot of times the first comments will be give them a soak. And it's true that soaking your ball python, the water, the movement of the snake, the stress of it all might make your snake poop. But the more correct answer is probably just wait longer. They'll poop when they're ready. You know, sometimes they, they'll wait until their next shed. Ball pythons can hold it for a while. So uh, soaking your snake in that case is not necessary and causes stress a lot of times. It's rare in ball pythons, but if you really think that your snake is constipated, see number two on my list. Now I will say that me even mentioning this is a little bit hypocritical because I am currently soaking Molly occasionally. And the reason is that Molly still is not the most consistent eater. And uh, there's this reptile soak uh, by Zoomed that um, Austin at, uh, Mutation creation. I don't know if it was one of his videos or one of theirs, but but he mentioned it. So I'm trying that. You know, you you uh, soak them in this electrolyte soak once a week or once every two weeks or something, and it's supposed to stimulate their appetite. So I'm giving that a shot. And with Molly, she's a little bit older. She's not a hatchling. She doesn't stress easily, and the soak is water that's just like goes halfway up her body is all. So she goes in there for a little bit of time, and she doesn't get too stressed out. I watch her and uh, she does just fine with it. Also, there's another scenario where I will soak a snake and that's if I'm shipping off a hatchling, I'll give them a 20 to 30 minute soak. Again, just up to, to about their midsection of their body before they go in the box and get shipped. That allows them to take a drink if they want, but they'll, they'll get some water in via their uh, skin also. And 
it makes sure that they're well hydrated before they go on that trip. So I think that's important. So there are times when it might be appropriate to soak your ball python, but it's certainly not a go-to fix for sheds uh, or for if you think that your snake's constipated or whatever. Uh, so keep that in mind. It does stress them out. Definitely don't swim your snakes. Ball pythons know how to swim, but they do not do it recreationally. So don't throw your ball python in a deep bathtub. It's gonna really freak them out. Number four, avoid feeding prey items that are too small. Lately, I've seen posts from people saying that they got a ball python at a pet store and the employee told them to feed it pinkies, which by the way is too small even for a hatchling ball python right out of the egg in most cases. Or they're posting and saying that they've had a ball python for a year and it's always just been on rat pups. Now, I have a couple of videos on feeding and I've addressed feeding a number of times, uh, but aside from mice versus rats, live versus frozen thought, all that stuff. Let's just focus on this one thing. And I can, I can say this pretty simply, I think. You've brought your ball python home and you wanna feed it its food. What you're gonna do is look at the thickness of the thickest part of the snake's body, this bit of thickness right here. And you're gonna feed it a rodent that is the same thickness or maybe slightly bigger than this. In, in this case, this would be like a weaned rat, but forget about weaned, rat pup, pinky, like all those names because everybody has different names. I buy my rodents uh, from either Rodent Pro or Lane Labs, sometimes Cold Blooded Cafe, and for all three of those, a weaned rat would be, the, would be the rat that I would feed this snake, or maybe a really small, small rat. Sometimes that happens. Now this rule goes for ball pythons and generally most snakes, but if you're feeding a snake that's not a ball python, do your research because some snakes require smaller. Uh, everybody has their own sort of parameters, but this is a good general rule. Take the thickness of your snake, feed it the same thing. Now, if you've eyeballed your rodent correctly, you can weigh that rodent and you'll find that it's probably about 10 to 15% of the body weight of the snake. That's the other rule that you can go by. Uh, just feed it 10 to 15% of the body weight and they'll be just fine. If you're feeding your snake an appropriate size prey item uh, at regular intervals, your snake will grow. And that means that the food item that you're feeding your snake needs to also go up in size. So keep that in mind. Your snake is not gonna be on rat pups forever. By the way, you guys, I'm thinking about doing maybe another feeding video where I look at the history of my snakes and find out how many meals they took before I switched them to the next uh, prey size. So how many, how many weaned rats did they eat before I bumped them up to a small rat? How many rat pups did they eat before I bumped them up to a weaned? Uh, let me know in the comments if you wanna see a video like that and I'll make it. Before we get to number five, let's cut to a very special Kent's Corner that he shot in a different location this time. You ruined the surprise. Hi, and welcome to Kent's Corner, everybody's favorite thing to click on on the internet. Today, you might be looking at the background and noticing that it's very different than the normal Kent's Corner. You're thinking, Kent, what kind of corner are you sitting in? Well, I've had a lot of fans request that they see what my life is like at my mom's house. And that's where I'm at, right here at me and my mom's house. And um, I'm sitting in one of my favorite corners right here, just hanging out. Um, there is Legos here, but they're not mine. They're uh, somebody, well, I mean, they, they are mine technically, but I'm building them to give to a child because Legos are um, a child's toy. So I build them and I give them to charity, to children um, who don't have Legos. So I will be building this. It's a Ninjago uh, Legacy Cruiser. And I'm gonna build this, and once it's built, it will look really cool displayed on a shelf of some sort. But I'm not gonna display it on my shelf because that's a child's thing. Thanks for watching, Kent's Corner. Everybody's favorite thing to watch that always happens in a corner of some sort. That was lovely, Kent. Thanks for that look at your life at home with your Legos. They weren't really mine. Well, I know of a great charity that they could go to, so I'm sure you won't mind if I take them to donate, right? No, that's fine. It's the only reason I had them anyway, so go ahead. And by the way, my thanks to these Patreon supporters who are helping this channel out a lot. These people, in my opinion, are the finest examples of human beings. They just went to patreon.com slash greenroompythons, and they spent like a minute and a half signing up, and now they are enjoying benefits while helping me to produce videos. So big thanks to you guys. Okay, on to number five. 
Avoid anthropomorphizing your snake. This is something that I've talked about in a few other videos, but it's really important. Anthropomorphizing is, uh, that, that would be putting human emotions or human traits onto a snake. But really what I'm talking about is putting mammal traits onto your snake, something that your dog or cat does. In some cases, this is no problem at all. For instance, in last week's video, Keegan was interacting with Ron, or Ron was actually trying to interact with Keegan. I, I, I know you. I know you. checked out. I know. <laughs> and I said, oh, he likes you. And he decided that he liked you and he wanted to see what you were all about. I said that to try to get Keegan more comfortable with the fact that Ron was trying to crawl on her. What was happening is Ron had decided that her hand was probably a safe space to crawl on, and uh, he was going for it. He probably had no emotion about Keegan as a person, whether positive or negative at all. But a case like that doesn't really matter. That's not gonna hurt the snake necessarily. But what about something like this? Sometimes I'll have a snake crawl out of their enclosure and onto my hand. And many of you know that I talk to my snakes like a crazy person, right? So sometimes I'll go, oh yeah, let's be friends. Come on out, You're, we're best friends now. Now that's harmless because I know in my brain that we're not best friends. This snake is just crawling on me because uh, they find me to be a safe way for them to get out of their enclosure and explore around a little bit. But what if I didn't, what if I truly believed that? Like I said that and I actually felt like that. And then all of a sudden every day I'm ripping my snake out of their hide and waking them up so that we can hang out because we're best friends. That happens with a lot of snake keepers and unfortunately with a lot of snakes, which is really stressful to the snake and it probably gives them like prolonged sleep deprivation. I don't know that anybody's done sleep studies on snakes, but you know, you don't want to wake them up all the time. I realize that I am waking all my snakes up to shoot this video with me, but I don't shoot videos every day. So quick examples, a snake's tongue flicking is not the same as a dog's tail wagging. I see that a lot. A snake going crazy on a slick surface or in water is not a sign that the snake is playing or exercising. And now I'm not talking about a breeding situation, but two snakes curled up together doesn't mean that they're best pals and should be housed together. My point here is that our response to a snake's behavior oftentimes has an effect on that snake. And if you are interpreting snake behavior the way you know mammal behavior, you're probably always interpreting it wrong. Uh, there are tons of videos about snake behavior. I have a few, but um, there's a bunch of other ones that, that you can watch. Just look up snake behavior or snake training. You're gonna run into uh, a bunch of probably Kevin McCurley's videos. He's a master at snake behavior or reptile behavior in general. Uh, you'll run into Lori Torini's videos. She's a master of snake training. And, um, and then I've got a couple of videos that talk about behavior and such, so. You know, not to brag, but I do. Consuming a bunch of those videos is gonna help out your understanding of these animals a lot. Number six, avoid being afraid to pick up your snake. I know that sounds a little bit unreasonable to ask, but I've been seeing this a lot where somebody will post, I just got my new snake and he hisses and strikes and how do I get him to stop doing that? Because I wanna be able to pick him up. This is a big topic, but I'm gonna to try to answer this quickly and I'll use some examples. Number one, Try to hang out with your snake without picking them up. So open their enclosure or whatever you need to do to just sit there and hang out with them so that they can see you not messing with them so that they don't think that that's all you do. You can even show them your hand a little bit. Let them tongue flick on, on your hand if they're not super strikey. That's really helpful to do. Let them get used to your hand without you then grabbing them. You know, just close the enclosure. Let them, let them be on their own. Maya here is a great co-host for this section, by the way, because out of all my snakes, she is the most likely to bite me because she just wants to taste to make sure my arm isn't food, because maybe it is. If you do need to pick up your snake, don't swoop in over the top of them like you're a starving falcon. Do it quickly and confidently like this, or like this, or like this, or like this. How many of these snakes am I gonna do? Or like this, or like this. I'm not gonna do all the snakes. Just try not to be afraid to get bit because it really is not a traumatic experience. It's a startling experience. But I tell you what, if you get bit by a mouse or a rat or get scratched by a cat or anything like that, bit by a bird, way worse. So not a big deal, really. Right, Maya? You little biter. Here's a great example of some new holes that Maya gave me in my hand just two days after shooting this video. Did it hurt? 
Yeah, I'm going to be honest, it hurt a little bit. Black-headed pythons bite much harder than ball pythons, and they hang on. But still, we're talking like three minutes of pain total. Okay, you guys, we did it. I even added a sixth thing to this video because I think Adam Wickens probably has a copyright on the five thing list videos. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. Don't bite my arm. Do not bite. <laughs>